Stanford University. Okay, well, welcome to CS 193P Fall of 2013-2014. Today, we're going to continue our discussion of attributed string from last time and talk about UI text view, which is basically a mutable attributed string viewer. Okay, it's just it's kind of like a UI label, but much more powerful, uh, and we'll talk about that. Then we're going to talk about a very important kind of conceptual thing in iOS 7 or in iOS in general, which is view controller lifecycle. So that's just the lifecycle of the controller part of your MVC um, and how it gets notified at different times in its lifecycle about what's going on. Uh, then we're going to talk about the radio station that I referred to in MVC. Um, we're going to talk about it in a little different context than we see in MVC because I just want to introduce it to you uh, now. And then throughout today's uh, uh, things, I'm going to be slides here. I'm going to be stopping every once in a while. We'll do a little demo, and then uh, we will uh, move back to the slides and back and forth as we cover various topics. Okay. So let's start with UI text view, like UI label in that it displays text but way more powerful because the text is multi-line. UI label, if you want it to be multi-line, you kind of have to say how many lines it is in advance, whereas UI text view, it's as many lines as it needs. Uh, it's also scrollable, editable, um, or just selectable if you want, and of course you get all the mutable attributed string setting of various things like colors and all that stuff. So UI text view, super powerful uh, object, but very easy to use. Uh, the way you use it is that it has a property called text storage, which is an NS text storage. NS text storage is a subclass of NS mutable attributed string. So you get this text storage and you can just start setting attributes or if the user, if it's editable, the user will start editing it and the attributes will just show up on this mutable string. It's a super great programming interface, new in iOS 7, okay, this is, this is having a mutable attributed string be uh, just vended like this by UI text view and editable on the fly by both the user and by you is all new and it's really incredibly awesome and easy to use. Um, there are some methods on UI text view like font, you know, property font where you can just set the font. Um, understand though that when you set the font, all it's doing is going through every character in the mutable string and setting the font attribute name, font, you know, that thing to this font. So, Remember that bold and italic are attributes of the font, okay? And so is the size, actually. So if you call this method set font, you know, it's called the set font setter there, uh, it's going to blast all of your bolds and italics and uh, size, okay? So you be a little careful of that. If you want to set the font, though, of every character and have that stuff preser preserved, just do a little for loop. Go through all the attributes in the mutable string, get the font that's already there. You can grab the symbolic traits that are off of it using the symbolic uh, traits method in UI Font Descriptor, and then create a new font that is the font you're trying to set, plus those traits, and then set it back as the attribute. So a little for loop there to do that. But I just want you to be careful about methods like set font, which are going to set the font attribute of all the characters. Okay. Uh, UI text view has incredibly advanced text layout mechanisms. For example, you can specify the container uh, that the text is going to be in, and you can even have exclusion zones. So if you had an image that was dropped in the middle of your text and you wanted the text to flow around it, even if it's a funny shaped um, thing, you can, uh, you know, image, you can flow around it, and you just, it's so easy to do it, unbelievable, you just create a Bezier path that encompasses the thing you want to flow around, and you just set that as an exclusion zone in the text container property here of UI text view, and it'll just flow around. So we're not going to talk about that advanced um, stuff. It's all part of text kit, which is new for iOS 7. Um, the layout manager is the thing that lays out the glyphs. So it takes all the characters and all the attributes and stuff, and it laying out the glyphs one by one. Uh, for those of you who don't know what glyphs are, they're kind of how you represent a character or a sequence of characters uh, on screen with some things. So the layout manager is a thing that lays the glyphs out inside the text container. So if you're interested in typography or you're going to do a final project that has a lot of text layout and stuff in it, this is where you get started there. Okay? So let's have a demo where we kind of combine all the things we saw in last lecture and this UI text view. Um, I'm going to call this uh, demo attributor because we're going to be 
uh, doing attributed strings here. And uh, it's going to look like this. It's going to be a totally new app, totally unrelated to Machismo. So I'm going to say create new project. Uh, let's go ahead and also hide others here. What we'll do in a second. So um, I'm going to do a single view application. We almost always start with that, a single MVC. This demo I'm eventually going to make into a multi MVC application at the next lecture. So, but we're going to start here. Uh, with this. So I'm going to call it attributor. I'm going to have the class prefix be attributor so that our controller is called attributed view controller. So let's do that. Uh, I'm going to put it in developer, same place I have machismo. This is my home directory developer. I'm not going to use source control. And here we go. So this is just a regular uh, app just as uh, you're used to. Uh, again, I like to move these delegate things into supporting files because we're not really going to be doing the delegate. Uh, this quarter we might actually do the delegates when we start talking about multitasking in iOS 7, but for most of the time you can just kind of move that out of the way. Um, here's my blank storyboard. Again, I'm going to go down to small size uh, instead of the tall size just so it fits. Okay, there's no reason to do that except for that it fits. And by the way, you're welcome to use the larger size uh, in your homework if you want. Um, cause as I ask you to do more and more in the homework, and you kind of need more and more space, which is fine. Um, of course, we need to think a little bit when we design user interfaces that this application might run on some users on smaller phones and on some users on larger phones, right? So we kind of need a user interface that can stretch. And next week we'll be talking about auto layout, which is a mechanism in iOS for you to design a user interface and specify how it stretches and shrinks, okay? Which is really important, and not just on different size iPhones, but different devices, iPads, you might be using them on a little window inside an iPad, et cetera. We want to make our views of our MVCs be shrinkable to at least to some extent. And of course, don't forget device rotation. When you turn your device, it all of a sudden gets wider than it is tall. Okay, well, everything needs to kind of move around to deal with that too. Okay, so we'll talk about all that next week. Uh, so let me show you the user interface I want to build here first so that you can kind of understand where I'm headed and then we'll write the code to do it. It's going to be primarily centered around a UI text view. So here I am looking at all my various things that I can drag out. So I'm going to go down here to UI text view, which is right. Where is that thing? Oh, too far down. UI text view. I can't find it. It's right there. OK, so UI text view displays multiple lines of text. So I drag it out. By default, it wants to be the whole size of the screen. But I'm actually going to put some other buttons and stuff in here. So I'm going to resize this to be smaller. Um, I also want it to have a little bit of edges here. Now notice that as I do everything in the UI, I'm using these blue lines. And I haven't really told you exactly why that is. But when we start talking about having these flexible sized views that are going to want to resize, these blue lines play a crucial role. And so when you're building your UIs, use the blue lines as much as possible. Because then when we start doing auto layout, the blue lines are going to help the auto layout system kind of get a clue as to what they should be doing. All right, so I'm going to have this text view here. And what I want to do is have some text. And I'll just use the default text. If you look over here, when you create a text view, you see you get this kind of uh, pseudo Latin text here. Um, then I'll just use that as the default. So that's going to be the text that's going to be in this when I run. And if I run this, I'll just get this text. Um, but what I want to be able to do is select some of the text. So I'm going to make this text selectable. Okay, Not editable, though, just selectable. And so I can select words in here. And I want to be able to change the color of the words, maybe put a little outline around the characters, Okay, do some fun stuff that we can do with attributed string um, in here. And what am I going to allow us to do? Well, let's see. Let me go get some buttons down here at the bottom. How about let's allow outlining. So I'm going to create a button down here called outline. And of course, let's also let us unoutline. So I'll create another button over here. I'll call it unoutline. That's probably not a word, but now that we know what we want. Again, I'm going to use the blue lines to try and get things you know, lined up as much as possible. This guy, let's put him right in the corner. These guys will line the baselines up. That's what the double line right there means, that the baseline of the other button line up. Uh, and we got also this right line was lined up, so they're going to stick to the edges and stay lined up. Um, so we'll allow out, uh, outlining and um, un outlining and unoutlining. And then also I'm going to allow setting colors. And the way I'm going to do that is kind of fun. So let's get a button out here. 
this is a good way to talk about, if I'm resizing, I want this button to be 64 by 64. I know that that's a good size. And I could try and oh, get it exactly the size I want, but it's actually much easier, if you know the size you want, to go over here in the size inspector, you see the size inspector, and you can just type in, I want 64 by 64, okay? So this size inspector we're gonna see in the, when we start talking about auto layout, layout a lot, there's going to be a, a lot of stuff down here describing how this thing gets constrained when things change size, but it's also good for uh, setting the size. And then once the size set, I'll move into a nice spot like that. Now, I could put like the word red here and make this a button that has the word red on it, and I could make the text be red. That's what I want this button to do. When I click here, I want whatever selected to turn red, but I'm gonna, instead of using words, I'm actually gonna use the color. I'm just gonna go to the inspector, and since a button inherits from control, and control inherits from view, see how that inheritance hierarchy is working in the inspector, I'm going to go down here and change its background color, which is the same thing we did when we set the background of the whole view to green, um, and I'm gonna set this one to, let's say this one's red. Okay, so now I have a nice red button here, and when I click on this, I'm gonna have to wire it up to make this turn red. So let's make some more buttons here of different colors. Again, I'm using the blue lines. See how they're snapping in place? Okay, I'm getting blue lines. Definitely want blue lines as much as possible. Um, so here, let's make this background be green. I'll make this one be orange. Make this one be Oh, I don't know, purple, okay? So now we have some colors and some outlines, and then let's also uh, make this thing, well, let's put a, a headline on the top here too. So let me grab another button. Actually, let's do a label for this one because I'm not gonna make it clickable. So I'm gonna put a label here at top. I'm gonna put something like CS193P rocks. Okay, so that's just gonna be my title of this thing. Want it nice and centered. Um, let's move this up so that it's locked. Let's resize it so it maximum space, it locks. And so now I've got this nice user interface. I've used blue guidelines for everything. Everyone's sticking on a blue guideline. That's gonna really be advantageous for us when we try to do auto layout with it. Now, let's talk a little bit about the fonts I wanna use here. And I told you in the slides that when you're displaying user content, okay, you wanna use the preferred fonts of the system, okay? And that's what I'm gonna do, both for this guy, this is clearly the user content. These two buttons are not user content. They're gonna stay the system fonts, okay, because they're buttons. Uh, but this title and this body are kind of user contents. You could argue that the title is not quite user content, but it kinda is. It might get localized to another language, or it might change depending on what's going on, I don't know, but it's really kind of a headline. Uh, so I'm gonna use the headline font um, to display uh, this guy right here. Actually, I also want this centered, All right? So let's make sure that's centered. And so the way you pick the um, headline font, the preferred font, which is headline, is you inspect the label and you go here to the fonts and you can see that it's currently set to be a system font. And I'm gonna go down here to text styles and pick headline. And that's basically in the code like saying preferred font of with text style headline. And you can see it changed there. Kind of got a little bold to it. Um, it's now the headline font. And the same thing here, the text view, I'm also gonna set it to use a preferred font. But in this case, I'm gonna use the body font because this is clearly like the body of this uh, content in this window. So now I've set these things to have the preferred fonts rather than the system fonts. And that's pretty much all that's required to set that up. So that's my UI, all right? So, yeah, question? Being iOS, is there an easy way to round out the corners on those buttons, or do you have to go through like a lot of masking? Yeah, so the question is, uh, if I wanted these to be like rounded rect buttons, which mm, it's not really a thing in iOS 7 to have rounded rect buttons, by the way. It was a thing in iOS 6, but not so much a thing in iOS 7. Uh, how difficult would this be? And the answer is, it wouldn't be that bad. It wouldn't be that hard. There's a mechanism, rounded rect is a one-liner to create a rounded rect. Um, and probably wouldn't make these UI buttons, we just make them views, and it's really a one-liner to have a tap gesture to tap on it and cause it to do something. So, you know, a few lines of code is really not that difficult. In fact, you can make it not just rounded rec, but any shape that you wanted there or whatever. Question? Does anyone include like a CSS in it though or no? Uh, so the question is, is there any way to include CSS? Um, 
Not really directly. However, these preferred fonts, for example, are plugged into the CSS system. So if you have content in your app that is coming from CSS source, you know, in a web view or something, we haven't talked about any of that yet, but uh, you can do that. The fonts can match up and all synchronize with each other. So there is some synchronicity there, but you can't directly display it. Um, okay, so let's look at the code to make this user interface do what we want. So I'm going to get my assistant editor up here. Um, let's put that right on the edge. Let's make some more space so you can oops, see more code. And you can see that my default view controller has this method here, view did load, which is part of the view controller lifecycle that we're going to talk about in a second, and also did receive memory warning, which is not, strictly speaking, part of the view controller lifecycle, uh, but we're, I'm going to talk about it as part of the view controller lifecycle. Uh, I'm not going to demo that today, but I am later going to demo view did load, so we'll leave that in there for now. Right now it doesn't do anything except for call super and have a comment. Okay. So um, what do I need to do here? A couple of things. One, I'm going to want to be setting the mutable string attributes of this thing. So I need an outlet to this. So I'm just going to control drag here to create an outlet. I'm going to call it body, okay, because it's kind of like my body uh, text view. And you can see that it's a UI text view. And I'm going to be able to send a message to this body to get its text storage, mutable string. And then I'm gonna just going to start setting attributes. Okay, it's going to be as simple as that. Um, you know, I'm going to also grab one to this, and you'll see why later. I'm going to call this my headline, okay? And uh, so I could call that my header or my heading or title label or something like that. I'm going to call it headline just uh, here to emphasize that we're talking about preferred fonts because I'm going to be showing that in the demo as well. Um, so we've got this body in the headline. We could conceivably set things about the headline. I don't really have time for that, but uh, we will be setting things in here. Uh, we got these colored buttons. Let's do those first. So I'm going to control drag here to have an action sent when we press on that button. I'm going to call this action change body selection color to match background of button. Okay, now you might laugh and say, whoa, that's a long name method. But long name methods are kind of preferred uh, in, uh, in object, in generally in Objective-C and all, especially in iOS, because Xcode's going to help you escape, escape complete these things. And uh, if you can have a method name like this that really matches, it says exactly what it does, it can be a good thing. It's programming, art of programming thing. Uh, I'm going to change the argument to be a UI button just like we did before and connect. So what does this method do? Well, hopefully with that long name, it's clear what it does, right? It changes whatever the selection is in our body right here. It changes the color of that to match the background view of this button. Okay, that's what this method is going to do. This is method is one line of code. Okay, so let's look at that one line of code. Um, we need to set attributes of the mutable string of our body. So I'm going to say self.body.textStorage. Now I have the uh, NS mutable attributed string. Text storage is a subclass of it, but it is an NS mutable string. And uh, I just want to add an attribute, which is the foreground color of whatever selected there. So the attribute is called NS foreground color attribute name. Okay. The value, that's the color we want to set it to. Well, I said we're going to have it match the background of the button, so I'm going to say sender, which is the button that's sending this thing, background color. Okay. And then the range is what range of this text view's storage do I want to set to be that color? Well, I said I want it to be the selection, the body selection. So there's a method in text view called selected range. And it returns an NS range of what's selected, okay, what the user selection is. Okay, so you can see one line of code, uh, and we've got our color, all four color buttons working, as long as they're all wired up, which we know that this one is, right? Okay, because we wired that one up. There it is right there. We haven't wired this one up, but let's do that, and this one, and this one, okay? So let's go ahead and uh, run. We'll try and see if we can run it on the device over here. See if that works today. Hopefully no technical issues will arise. Now, this is an iPhone app that we're running here, and we're running it on an iPad. I, my demo machine happens to be an iPad. 
So this is running kind of in iPhone emulation mode, okay, which is actually better in iOS 7 than it was in previous versions of iOS. Um, it's not quite exactly the same. You notice that the status bar at the top, you don't get the, uh, you know, what your carrier is and the battery life and all that stuff. That's kind of cut off, uh, but otherwise uh, it's pretty similar. So you can see that we got that kind of pseudo-Latin text in there, and it's scrollable, and it's also uh, selectable. So I just double tapped on that word, and uh, we got it. Now, incredible, you get things for free on this, like defining words, looking them up in the dictionary. So if we hit define right here, it goes and looks it up. Not screwed, not bound, not understand, not, uh, no surprise there. Uh, but you can look that up. And of course, hopefully all our buttons work. So let's try um, red, that worked, and orange, and purple, okay, green. So that's working, that's setting things. Right. I could actually extend my selection, go orange, sets it all orange, pick another word, red. So that's working, super easy, okay? Everyone understand what we've done so far? So now let's go on and do the um, outline button and the unoutline button. So I'm just going to control drag from there. I'm going to call this outline. Uh, I don't need any argument here because I'm not looking at the button to determine uh, how to do it. And in fact, eh, in spirit of not long message name, let's call it outline body selection. Okay, because that's kind of even clearer exactly what the outline is, is going to outline. So let's do that. Here we have outline body selection. Uh, again, this one's same thing as before, body text storage. And we're going to add attribute, but to actually to do an outline, we need to do two things. One thing is we need to set the stroke width. Okay, that's the width that the character gets stroked, not filled, but stroked, its outer edge. And we also want to set the color of that stroke. I want it to be black. Okay, so if we have a word and its color is selected, it'll still fill with that color. Okay, because I'm going to specify a stroke that does a fill and a stroke, but it's gonna, the outline's going to be in black. So when we do add attribute, we need to do add attributes, plural, because we're going to add two attributes. Now, this is a dictionary, and I can just create this dictionary right on the fly here with our at sign curly brace. And one of the things we want is the stroke width. So here's the stroke width attribute name. And I'm going to set the stroke width to minus three. Okay, minus three, if you'll recall, means stroke width of three and also fill. If I said stroke width of three of at sign three, it would not fill. It would be clear, right? In the middle of it would be clear. So we don't want that. We want to fill whichever color we picked. We want that too. So that's that. And then let's also set the stroke color, color attribute to be UI color, black color. So I'm just doing this mostly so you can see. Uh, how to put a, you know, app, an actual color in there instead of here where we grab the color from somewhere else. You can use these class methods in UI color to do that. And we need the range, same thing as before, selected range. Okay. So now we're going to add both those attributes to set, uh, to outline it. That's all we need there. Let's, uh, let's do unoutline while we're here. Save ourselves a little bit of time. I'm going to call this unoutline body selection. None. And just again to show you a different method, let's unoutline by removing any stroke width attribute. I could probably set the stroke width to zero as well, but I'm going to remove so that you can see uh, how in NS mutable attributed string we can remove attributes. We just say remove attribute, NS stroke width attribute, range, self.body.selected range. Okay, so that's going to remove that attribute. We don't really need to remove the stroke color uh, because if it's not being stroked, then the color doesn't matter. So it's kind of in there. It's a little extra, kind of you could argue maybe wasted storage. Although the storage of attributed string is really optimized to the nth degree. Okay, so I wouldn't worry too terribly much about that. All right, so let's go see if that works. Okay, so let's pick another word here, like this one. Outline it. That is outlined. It just looks bold because it's filled with black still. Okay, because black was the color there. But if I fill it with orange, you can see it looks a little different, right? Or go over here to this word. Let's fill it, make it red and then outline it. Okay, 
Everyone cool with that? And then we can unoutline as well. Go back to red, so outline, unoutline. Okay? Everyone understand that? Okay, so that's it for now. We'll be back to this in a second. Yeah? So I'm not quite sure that I understand the difference between uh, the negative field and the positive field. Like, why it's getting filled or isn't getting filled? Okay, great question. So let's just be 100% clear. What's the difference between the negative three that we have right here, okay, and positive three? Negative three means in fact, you know what? I'll show you a demo of it. A little later, we'll, we'll see the button that says outline. Later, we're going to change it to be outlined, okay? And we won't fill it, and you'll see the difference, that it's not going to be filled with a color, okay? So let's get back to the slides, though. And over here. Next. Okay. View controller life cycle. Okay, so this is an important thing to understand, the view controller life cycle, because a lot of the things that you're going to control about how your view controller moves through time are going to be controlled by the methods that are part of the view controller lifecycle. Now, all the view controller lifecycle is is a series of methods okay, that are sent to UI view controller when things happen. Now, your controller is a subclass of UI view controller. You've probably noticed that. If you look at your code, you'll see uh, that your controller that gets created for you by the template when you create a new app is a subclass of UI view controller. So it's going to be sent these messages, and you're going to override them if you want to find out when these things are happening. Don't forget to call super. Okay. Um, why do you need these things? Well, you need to be able to initialize your controller. You need to be able to find when you come on and off screen. You need to know when your when your bounds change, right? Your geometry changes. You, you can't. You got to know these things for your uh, view controller's view to successfully live in the iOS world. So the start of this life cycle is creation. Okay. Most view controllers are created out of storyboards. And I told you that storyboards don't generate code. They're basic, you're basically editing those objects live. That UI text view, those buttons, you're editing them live in Xcode. And when the, that storyboard gets saved, they kind of get freeze dried. And then when your application runs, that water gets added back to them and they come back to life. Okay, So that's the creation part of the life cycle. And we don't really do much at creation. In fact, I'm not even going to talk about creation until the very end of the view controller lifecycle. Even though it's, it is chronologically the beginning, it's by far the least important. So I'm emphasizing that by putting it at the end. But after it's created, it goes through the following process. Your outlets get set. Okay, Got to have those outlets set. Then your uh, view controller appears on screen and it might disappear from screen. You haven't seen that yet because right now you've only had one view controller in your whole app. It only disappears when the app quits. But when you have multiple view controllers, they'll appear and disappear on screen. Their geometry changes, either device rotation or something else can cause their bounds to change of your view of your MVC. Low memory situations, again, not strictly speaking part of the view controller lifecycle, but that can happen while you're running. And at each of these steps, a method gets called. So let's look at the first one, view did load. So that's the one we saw in the code that I didn't delete. This is a really great place to put initialization code for your controller. You can kind of think of it as where you would put all the stuff from your init, okay? Because your init is not going to get called, as you're going to see, uh, for your view controller. So why is this better than init? Because your outlets are set, okay? Very important for your outlets to be set usually if you want to initialize your view because you want to set your labels to say something or whatever. Um, you know, in the, the Machismo game, we started with the cards face down because we didn't really know how to start face up. Okay, well, this is where you would set the first card, right? You draw the first card, have it, this is the Machismo, not your assignment, but what we did in class. Uh, have it start with the card face up, you would do this in view did load. Because here, your outlets are set, so I can talk to that button. It was a single button in Machismo at the time. Uh, but I'm not on screen yet. View did load gets called before you come on screen. Uh, so it's a great place to do stuff like that. View did load will only ever be called once in the lifetime of your controller. Period. Once. It never gets called more than once. Okay. It is a spectacularly great place to put initialization code. However, there are limits to what can go in view did load, most especially geometry code. At the time view did load is called, the bounds of your view is not finalized. 
it's probably just sitting at whatever it was in the storyboard, which may or may not be what's going to happen when it's on screen, because it might be on a little different device or a different place, or it might be rotated or something like that. So you do not want to put geometry related code, in other words, any initialization that has to do with what the shape of your view is in view to load. Okay? That's the major restriction of view to load. But otherwise, it's a great place because it only gets called once before you go on screen, after your outlets get set. It's an awesome method. Okay? Highly recommend it. Now, just before your view controller ap view appears on screen, you get view will appear. Okay? This is a pretty good place to put things. It's not really as awesome as view did load in some ways. And I'm not even sure I'd put geometry related stuff in here, as you'll see in a couple of slides. However, there are some things you do want to put in here. Now, one thing you want to be careful about not putting in view will appear is one time initialization that really belongs in view did load. Because again, when you have multiple MVCs in your app, they're going to be appearing and disappearing. And so view will appear is going to get called multiple times. Okay? Every time your view appears back on screen, view will appear gets called again. So if it's a one-time initialization, you put it in view will appear, it's going to happen every time your thing reappears. So what does go in view will appear? Well, um, one thing is if there's some initialization you need to do based on some data that might have changed while your view controller's view was off screen. Okay? So like your model. Something changed in your model, your view controller was off screen, so it wasn't really listening for changes in the model, and then it's coming back on screen, oh, you better sync up with the model. Does that make sense? Because you were off screen and now you're appearing, and so this is a good thing to put in view will appear, is synchronization with things that might have changed while you weren't visible, including things that you know, we're changing before you appeared for the first time, because view will appear, of course, gets called the first time you appear as well. Okay, this is not view will reappear, it's view will appear. Okay, so that's a good thing uh, to put in here. Um, we'll talk later in the course about putting uh, code in here for optimization purposes, because uh, if you put something that's going to take a lot of resources, like you're going to make some network call in view did load, and what if your MVC never appears on screen? Well, you wasted that time doing that network call in view did load. Whereas if you do it in view will appear, even though you're going to have to design it because if you do something in the network, it's going to come later. It's not going to be instantaneously available. That's okay. We'll talk about how to do multi-threaded and make that all work. Um, kicking it off in view will appear might be a little better performance because you know when you get view will appear that your view is going to appear on screen. Okay? So it's worth it to do something expensive. But that's kind of advanced stuff, so don't worry about that too much for now. The view's geometry is set here, so you could do some initialization based on geometry here, and a lot of people do it because it's kind of simple, uh, but there's actually a better place to do geometry uh, based initialization, uh, but it's okay, it's quote, okay to do it in view will appear, uh, as long as you understand that your geometry could change after view will appear. In other words, you can be on screen and someone could rotate the phone and now your geometry just changed, okay, so you better deal with that. Okay, that you're not going to get view will appear uh, when you rotate, you're going to get other things. Okay, you also get notified when your view goes off screen, so that view will disappear. Okay, and what do you want to do in here? You don't usually do a lot of stuff in here. If you're doing something uh, like animation or something, obviously this would be a good place to stop doing that because when view will disappears happens, really you want your view controller to become a good citizen. Stop using resources. You're not on screen. Stop it. Okay? You'll get view will appear when you go back and you can sync back up to the world, but when you, after you disappear, you kind of want to lay low. All right, in terms of memory usage and certainly CPU, you don't want to be using CPU. CPU. So this is a good place to do uh, stuff like that. And to maybe remember state that you're going to restore and view will appear again, whatever. Kind of what you might think. Um, there's also did versions of these. View did appear and view did disappear. And that happens exactly what you might think, right? View did appear gets called after you're now on screen. Okay? You just appeared and you just got called. Okay? And same thing, view did disappear, you just disappeared. Um, okay, now let's talk about geometry. Okay, I put this off uh, to this slide. Your geometry in iOS 6, they introduced these really cool two methods view will layout subviews and view did layout subviews. This is where to put geometry related code. So, view will layout subviews is called just before 
iOS 7 tries to lay out your subviews, tries to lay out your view, okay? So your geometry just changed, maybe from portrait to landscape, and there's a lot of automated stuff in iOS 7 called auto layout that will try and move everything around to fit. Now, it can't always do it, but it tries, okay? So view will lay out subviews is called before that, and view did lay out subviews is called after it's done that, after it's made that attempt. Okay? Now, if, you, if there are some things that have to be moved manually, you have to move them by hand, okay? uh, that you just, there's no way to express in the automatic layout rules where things go, then the best place to do it is probably in view did layout subviews. Okay? Because the system's already laid things out, now you can move around the last few pieces uh, that need to be laid out. But things like buttons, you know, like that outline and unoutline button, it's really easy to make it so that when you rotate to landscape, they move down to the corners. Okay? That's what you'd probably want there. Same thing, the text view. Pretty easy to make it widen out and get shorter when it goes to landscape. Okay? Um, but like in Machismo, you got all those cards. When you turn it, you might want to use some logic to figure out where are you going to lay the cards out in a landscape orientation versus portrait. Okay? And you're going to have to do that next week. Okay? Not this week. Um, so, I want to talk a little more about auto rotation. So, this is the thing where you turn the phone and your geometry automatically gets changed. That automatic change to the new geometry only happens if these conditions are true. Your view controller has to return yes from should auto rotate, which is the default. Uh, your view controller has to return that new orientation from supported interface orientation. So, that is a method that returns an enum. Uh, with landscape and portrait, portrait upside down in there. So you have to say that you support the various rotations. I believe by default it supports all rotations. And your application as a whole has to say that it supports that new orientation. Okay, and that is set, remember when we first built our application and it ran, there was like all these kind of settings for our app that I just waved my hand and said, we'll look at this later. Well, one of the settings in there is which orientations of a device, portrait, landscape, portrait upside down, uh, do you support? Okay? So you have to click on the ones that you support. Uh, and if you do all these things, then when the device rotates, your bounds of your view will automatically be changed and you'll get the whole view will layout subviews, view did layouts subviews, auto, auto layout, all that happening. Okay? Uh, there are also methods that get called. I put them in gray here because we're not really going to look at them. They're rarely needed. Auto layout and uh, view did layout subviews are usually going to cover everything you need. But if you wanted to get involved in the animation of the rotation and all that, it's all possible, but we're not really going to look into that. Okay, in low memory situations, you're going to get this message to your view controller called did receive memory warning. Okay? And low memory doesn't necessarily mean your app is using a lot of memory. It just might be all apps on the phone combined are using a lot of the memory and it needs some of it back. And so it might be sending this to lots of applications. Um, it's completely up to the system to decide whether it wants to generate this warning. And your only responsibility when you get this thing is to try and free up memory. Okay? That means in the heap. And that means setting strong pointers you have to nil. Okay? Now, if, you're, if you display an image, okay? if your MVC's view displays an image, that's big memory. Images are a lot of memory. Okay? Or it plays a sound. That's a lot of memory. But if your thing is on screen, if your view controller is on screen, you can't throw that m image out. It needs to be on screen. So there's really not much you can do when you get did receive memory warning if you're on screen. Now, However, if you have an alternate image or something that's not on screen right now, you could set that to nil as long as you can recreate it. Okay? Either recreate it by getting it from the file system, even making a network call to download an image as long as the image doesn't need to be instantly available. Um, but that's an example of how you could respond to this, especially if you're off screen, you could respond to this. Although my argument is when you go off screen and you get view did disappear or view will disappear, you should free up that stuff anyway, okay? And get it back when you do view will appear because you don't want to be a memory pig, okay? Now, what does it matter to be a memory pig? Why do we care? Well, a couple of things. Okay, first of all, by the way, only things that use a lot of memory are things like images, video, sound. Those can use a lot of memory. Small things like little dictionaries with five things in them, 
that's using virtually no memory. I wouldn't even waste your time uh, freeing those up. Okay, that's just going to make your code complex for nothing. So we're talking about good size things, okay, when we say free things up. But anyway, why do we want to be a good citizen here? Well, um, iOS has the right to kill your app if it thinks you're being a memory hog. Okay, if there's not enough memory on the system and your app happens to be using a lot of memory, it can just come along and say, bam -o, killing that baby. Uh, it's perfectly within its rights. Um, if you're a good memory citizen, it's never going to do that. Okay? But being a good memory citizen means you shouldn't be using a lot more memory than you know, a single MVC that's on screen right now, or if you're on the iPad, maybe it's three or four MVCs, depending on what your layout is. You know, however much memory that would be reasonable to use, a video in there, no problem, et cetera, that's fine. But if you have like 20 videos sitting in the heap, okay, you're going to be a candidate to get blasted. Okay? So uh, the other thing is you obviously want other applications to have as much memory available to them when the user switches back and forth. If you've got a reputation as a memory pig, like, oh, when I run this app, all my other apps will you know, slow way down, oh, it's terrible, then on the App Store, you, people are going to say that, and you're going to get a bad reputation, and people aren't going to want your application. So that's another reason not to be a memory pig. Check this kind of stuff to see how much memory you'd use before they would approve an app. Is that a thing? Uh, so the question is, does Apple go and check to make sure you're being a good memory citizen before they approve you? Uh, I would say, I don't know. I don't work for Apple. I don't know what's going on behind the scenes there in terms of their approval process. My guess is, if they ran your app and it just immediately ballooned up huge amount of memory, they would not approve it. That's just my guess. I mean, I wouldn't if I were them. Um, and you know, certainly apps that are out there that have a reputation of being big memory pigs, maybe when you submit your next version or something, they're like, wait, wait a second, did you fix that memory thing? You know what I'm saying? It's common sense. Common sense. Okay, so that's that. Okay, now I told you I would talk about creation of the view controller, and so I'm going back and talking about it here, and I'm only going to talk about it briefly because it's really not super important because view did load is where you want most of your initialization. But when your view controller is created, when it's pulled out of that storyboard and unfreeze dried, your init method is not called. Okay, a different init method is called the unfreeze drying init method, which is a generic init method. Uh, mechanism that we're not going to, well, we might talk about it in week eight or nine of this course. Not that important. But that's what Xcode uh, uses to freeze dry your app. So um, that init, you don't subclass that init. Okay? Okay, it's an init. I'm not even going to tell you the name of it. You don't subclass it. Um, instead, when something gets unfreeze dried from a storyboard, anything, not just your controller, but even like a button or anything else comes out of there, this method, awake from nib, nib is an old uh, historical name. You could think of it as awake from storyboard. Uh, this gets called, and you can put in here things that you might normally put in your init. Although again, your outlets are not set at this point, so you're better off putting stuff in view to load. Okay? But if there's some reason you can't put something in view to load, I can't even think of a good example why that would be, you can put things in awake from nib. Now, to make this a little more complicated, but also a little more correct, it is possible that your view controller could be created in code using alloc init. It is legal to, for someone to alloc init. Init is not the designated initializer for a view controller, but it, init calls the designated initializer. So it is legal for people to do that. You, not going to happen in this class. Okay. We're going to make things out of storyboards for 100% of this class, so don't worry about it. But the designated initializer for UI view controller is init with nib name colon bundle colon. Okay? Uh, again, historical reasons here with old nib files. And so to be correct, we usually like to call whatever we're going to call from awake from nib also in that init method. And so you use this little template where you have some method called setup or something. Awake from nib calls that. And then init with nib name says self super init with nib name bundle, because that's the designated initializer. Self setup return self. OK? So if you're going to put awake from nib in there, go ahead and put this little three line init with nib name also in there, just to be correct. OK? Probably not necessary in this class. I don't think you're going to need awake from nib in this class. View did load is what you want. Okay, so here's a summary of the view controller life cycle. It's instantiated from the storyboard, or someone could say alloc init. Okay, awake from nib gets called, 
It became out of a storyboard, otherwise init with nib name numbundle get, bundle gets called. The outlets get set, if it comes from a storyboard. Then view did load is called. Then when the geometry is determined, view will lay out subviews, and view did lay out subviews, there should be no colons there, I don't know what that, that's a mistake, uh, get called. Then view will appear gets called. Then, if the geometry changes again, while it's visible, view did lay, will lay out subviews, and view did lay out subviews will get called again. Okay? If there's auto-rotation, auto -rotation, you also get those auto-rotation things, but don't worry about those, because you're usually doing what you want to do in view did lay out subviews. Then, when your view controller goes off screen, it'll get view will disappear. Okay? Uh, if you have a low memory thing at any time going on there, you'll get that. That could be while you're visible or not. And that's it. That's the view controller life cycle from start to finish. Okay. All right. So let's see a little demo of using the view controller life cycle. So what I'm going to do is that outline button we talked about before. Let's make it so the outline button is itself outlined. That would be kind of a good UI. Okay. So it's kind of a little more indication of what it does. Well, the question is, if I have this outline button right here. Um, how and when am I going to outline it? I can't do it in Xcode, unfortunately, so I need to do it in code. But I want it to be outlined when the thing first comes up, but, and I want it to always be outlined. So that's a one-time initialization thing that it obviously has to happen after my outlets are set, because I need to be able to talk to this button. So let's make an outlet for this. I'm just going to control drag here. I'm going to call this the outline button. Okay, and. I'm going to take view did load. I'm actually going to move it up to the top here. Okay, so there's view did load. And I'm going to do exactly what it says here. Do any additional setup after loading the view. <laughs> this should say typically from a storyboard. It's funny that that has not changed. I mean, storyboards have been around for, I don't know, iOS 4, 5, 6, 7, something, and they're still saying from a nib. But anyway, um, view did load is the place to do this. And all we need to do is set the attributed title of this button to have the attributes of outline. So how are we going to do that? Okay, And this is important for you to pay attention here. You all look awake, that's good, because your homework that's going to be assigned uh, on Wednesday is going to require this. You're going to have to set a attributed title of a button, okay? because your cards are buttons, unfortunately. They won't be buttons the week after that. But they're buttons right now, and so you're going to need attributed strings to display what we want to do next week, and so you're going to have to set attributed title of a button. So let's talk about um, how we do that. First thing I'm going to do is um, I'm going to say ns mutable attributed string title equals. So I want to get the title of this button as a mutable attributed string so that I can set the attributes to be the outline attributes, that stroke width thing. So the way to do that is I'm going to say ns mutable attributed string alloc init with string self dot outline button dot current title. So whatever's on there currently, which is the word outline right now, I'm going to use that. And then um, that's it. That's all I'm going to do there, just so you show you how to do this this way. I could set the attributes there, actually, but oops. Did I get that right? OK. So now I have the title uh, uh, as an attributed, a mutable attributed string. So now I can set the attributes in this title. OK, now this title is a NS mutable attribute string that I just created. It's a local variable. It, it's created with the button's title, but it's a local variable. Um, so let's go ahead and set the attributes we want. OK, again, it's very similar to this down here. In fact, I'm going to just copy and paste this and make one small change. OK, so here, instead of the minus 3, OK, I'm going to make it 3. And that's going to make this outline thing be outlined with no blue in the middle. OK, so the foreground color of this button is blue, or whatever the default is black. But uh, I'm going to make it so it's outlined with nothing in the middle. The other thing is I don't really want this button to be black. Okay, because buttons are not black. Now, what color are buttons? Okay, and this brings up another uh, interesting uh, thing we really haven't had a chance to talk about, which is the tint color. 
okay? And some of you have discovered this on your own because you didn't like the blue tint on the green background of machismo, and I applaud you and your UI instincts to go searching for a way to change that. And the right way to change it is there's actually a global tint color, a tint color for your entire application. And you set that by going to your storyboard. See, so you I have my storyboard selected over here. And if I go to the uh, little area here that has all my attributes inspector, if I click the leftmost one, which is the file inspector, it's inspecting the storyboard file, you'll see there's global tint. Okay, so global tint affects all clickable things in your app everywhere. Okay, so you can pick a different color than blue, uh, and we do that. Uh, the other thing is individual elements like UI buttons, they also have a tint color. Now usually you don't want to set them separately, although someone, uh, a couple people noticed what seems to be a bug in the simulator, where if you don't, if you set the global tint, it's like it draws improperly a segmented control in the simulator. I haven't heard back whether it does it on the device, but um, so the workaround was to set the individual tint color. Um, so you can set tint color individual items, or you can set it uh, at the storyboard level. Here what I'm going to do, I'm not going to set it, but I am going to get it. I'm going to get the tint color because I, whatever this tint color is, I want that to be the color of, that I'm stroking it with, the outline color. So that is going to be self.outlinebutton.tint color. Tint color. Okay. Understand what I was doing there? So I want it to stay blue or whatever this color is, um, but I want it to be outlined only. And then the range, I need the entire range of text. In other words, I have this mutable string title here. I want the entire thing done. So I'm going to use NS make range. And you're going to find that for C structs in iOS, there's usually an NS make whatever you want that will make the C struct by letting you specify the members of the struct. So in this case, a range has um, a location, a starting location, which will be 0. And it has a length. Okay, which is going to be title length. Okay, so that makes a little range. That's going to set the entire range to have these attributes. Okay, now I have the title I want as a mutable string, but I need to set this back on the button. Okay, because I've only done this as a local variable right here. Because there's no mutable attributed string in button like there is in text view that you can just modify. You have to get it, make a mutable version you know, edit it and then set it back. And the way we do that is self.outline button, set attributed title, title for state, UI control state normal. Okay, so it's just like set title, but it's like attributed title. Okay, so let's see if that works. Okay, and it did. So you can see the outline right there is outlined. It's not awesomely outlined. Or it's kind of hard to see that it's outlined. I might want to go back to here and set this, for example, this outline button, instead of being just the system font, maybe I want this to be bold system font, which, whoops, which will make it outline a little better. So let's go to the here, inspect it, and in the font here, instead of using the system font, I'm going to use the bold system font. And now when I run, it'll look a little bolder. So it's a little better, a little easier to see the outline. Okay, and it's still a button. If I click it, it still outlines the text. Okay? All right, that's all I wanted to show you there. Let's, um, I'm going to show you another view controller lifecycle thing. But first, let's do a couple of slides. I want to show you one other thing, which I promised I would show, which is this um, radio station thing. So the way of communicating between objects in a blind, structured way, uh, which we refer to as this radio station thing from the MVC, is called notifications in iOS 7. And uh, we're only going to talk today about how to tune into the radio station. We're not going to talk about how to broadcast on a radio station. And in specific today, we're only going to tune into a system radio station, an iOS 7 radio station. Uh, what later in the course, when we start talking about building more sophisticated models using databases, then we'll really start using the radio stations to hear about changes in the model. Okay, but today we're just going to hear about change in the system because I just want to get an idea of what that radio station looks like on the receiving end. And it's really, really easy. There is a class called NS Notification Center. 
it has a class method called default center. That returns a shared instance, kind of like NS user defaults, standard user defaults did. A shared instance, that's the object you use to tune into radio stations. And you do it by sending it this message, add observer selector name object. The first argument, observer, that is the object that wants to listen to the radio station. So in your controller, because controllers are the most common radio station listers, this would probably just be self. Okay, add observer self. This is somewhere in your controller code. Selector is the method inside of the observer that you want to be called when something appears on the radio station. Some broadcast happens. Okay? Name is the name of the radio station. Okay, which radio station you want to listen to? And sender there, object sender, that's if you only want to listen to radio station broadcasts that come from a certain other object. Often you pass nil here, which means if anyone broadcasts on that frequency, I want to hear it. Okay? But it is possible in certain cases to say I'm only interested in changes in the radio station generated by this object. So that's what the sender there that you would put. Okay? The method that's going to get invoked here, method to invoke if something happens, uh, always has one argument, which is an NS notification. Inside an NS notification there are three properties. One is name, that's the name of the radio station, same thing that was passed above. Object, okay, that's the object sending you this uh, notification, so that would be the sender and the thing above. And then user info, which is an ID, and to know what that is, you have to know what the person who broadcasts on the radio station says they will provide there. Does that make sense? So that user info is radio station dependent. So, but if you know the name of the radio station, you probably are looking in the documentation to find it. It probably says there, oh, and the user info you'll get is X, Y, or Z. But it's an ID, so you have to know what it is. You're probably going to do is kind of class on it or response to selector or something like that um, and, uh, and you, to use it. A lot of times that's nil because all we really are interested in is whether there was a broadcast, not any particular information that was broadcast. Question. Is that global over just your app or global over the whole system? All this stuff, the question is, is the sender there global to the whole system or just inside your app? Always everything about notifications inside your app, okay? Because the space of objects in the heap is only inside your app. You can't see in other apps, you know, they're, they have their own segregated, for security reasons, space. So if you're getting an, a message here from the system, this is going to be nil. Okay, the sender's going to be nil. Question. Is that your question? Okay. All right. So another thing to understand is when you're done listening, tune out, turn your radio off. Okay. And you do that by sending a message to the notification center saying remove observer. And you can remove yourself as an observer of all radio stations with the first one, or you can just remove yourself from listening to certain radio stations. Okay. By specifying the name of the radio station and who the sender is you don't want to listen to anymore. Okay. It's important to do this because, unfortunately, the notification center keeps a pointer to you that is called unsafe retained. So it's not strong or weak, it's unsafe retained. And what unsafe retained means is that if you go out of the heap without calling this first, the notification center might try and send you a notification and crash your app. That's why it's unsafe. Now, why are they using unsafe retained here? Clearly, for backwards compatibility, this really should be weak. Okay? It would be awesome for this to be a weak pointer to you because then if you went out of the heap, it would be set to nil inside the notification center. It would never try and send you any messages. Um, but you know, the whole weak mechanism of setting things to nil automatically, that's an iOS 6, iOS 7 only thing. So if you had an app that was running on iOS 5, that wouldn't work. And if this depended on that, eh, it would be bad. Uh, I'm sure eventually they would probably move these things to weak and just say, if you use this API, it's deprecated, you can't run on iOS 5, I don't know, maybe they'll do that in iOS 8 or 9, I don't know. But be careful there, it's unsafe retained. It's the only unsafe retained really you're probably going to have to worry about in this uh, course. But the bottom line is, remove yourself when you're done listening. Now, normally you're going to remove yourself when your MVC goes off screen, okay? because you're usually only interested in radio station happenings when your MVC is active and on screen. But if for some reason that doesn't make sense, there is a method called dialloc. Every object has this. Uh, it gets called 
just before your object leaves the heap. Okay? All your properties are nil, you are barely existing as an object, and this gets called. Okay? It's that last hook, and so you can fix unsafe retained pointers to you there. Okay? I don't recommend using dialic. Don't use it for anything else, that's for sure, uh, in this class. I suggest rem removing it when it makes sense. Good question. You remove yourself as an observer and you're not an observer on anything? Is that kind of... Great question. So the question is, what if I call remove observer and I'm not observing anything? No problem. Not, nothing bad will happen. You could just throw that in the alley. You could. You could. It wouldn't be very nice programming because it's kind of not very pretty, but you could just throw that in, every, in your dialic and to be safe. But better to, you know. Okay. So here's an example. This is an example I'm going to demo real quick here, which is text size. So in iOS 7, not in any iOS before that, but in iOS 7, if you use preferred fonts, then the user can actually go into settings and change the size of their font. So if they're like me, and the phone has to be held farther and farther away as the years go by, you can set the text size up and move that phone back in a little bit. So that's what this text size thing allows you to do. Well, if that text size font change happens, you have to get notified so that you can change the fonts. Use the new preferred font um, that the user set, okay? So you get that notification by signing up in the default center for the radio station called UI content size category did change notification, okay? Could argue it could be called something like preferred fonts change, but it's not. UI content size category did change notification, okay? You sign up for that, and whenever those fonts change size, your method, preferred font size change is what I called mine, will get called, okay? So uh, let's take a look at how we would add that to attributor, because attributor uses preferred fonts, and if we change the font size, we want the body and the headline both to change to the bigger or smaller font. So let's do that. I'm going to go back here to Xcode. So here we are. The other thing we're going to need to make this work is the view controller lifecycle. Okay? Because we're only interested in those font changes if we're the MVC that's on screen, which we always are, of course, uh, because we only have this one MVC. But soon we will have other MVCs and we won't always be on screen. Um, so let's use the view controller lifecycle method view will appear. Okay, so when a view will appear, notice I'm always going to do super will view, super there. You can call super before or after you do your work. It kind of depends on what you want. Do you want your super class to get a chance after you've done what you want to do or before? Usually it doesn't matter too much. I don't know that UI view controller actually does things in these supers, but you always want to give them the opportunity. Okay, it's just part of the view controller lifecycle. So uh, when the view appears, I just want to sign up with the notification center so that I can receive these messages. So all I'm going to say is NS notification center, default center, add observer, self. Okay, I'm going to want these messages sent to myself. The selector, remember we have to say at sign selector when we want to specify thing. I'm going to call it preferred fonts changed. Okay. Name is UI content size category. Ooh, luckily I get to tab through that one. Okay. And the object is nil. In other words, if anybody sends that, I'm going to change my preferred fonts. Okay. Notice there's a warning here. That's because I don't implement this. I believe that's new in iOS 7. I don't remember seeing that before. Okay, thank you. Too many R's. Preferred. Okay, view, okay, void here, preferred, pre whoops, two Fs now, okay, preferred fonts changed, takes an NS notification star, okay, notification, I'm not going to use that because it's basically Boolean, um, and I'm actually going to call another method, I'm going to call use preferred fonts, and you're going to see why here in a second, okay, so that set it up so that anytime my view appears, I'm going to get this use preferred fonts sent to me, preferred fonts sent, and in here I have to make my text view and my headline use the new preferred fonts, and that's really, really easy to do. Self.body.font equals UI font preferred for textile, UI font textile, this is the body, so I'm going to do body. So this has allowed me an excuse to show you how to set these preferred fonts in code instead of setting them in Xcode. This is how easy it is. 
Okay. Now I'm setting the font of the UI text view, so if I had any bolds or italics, unfortunately this would blast them. So obviously I would need to iterate through all the attributes and look at the font, get the symbolic traits, apply them like I talked about earlier. And then let's do the same thing for the headline, but its font wants to be the preferred font for headline, which is this one. Okay, so that's that. Um, one last thing to consider here is I need to stop listening. Uh, we'll do it in will, disappear, could do it in either, but. Okay, when I'm going to disappear, I want to stop listening. And so again, NS notification center, default center, remove observer. Now some would argue just putting self here, but I actually think that's bad coding because you know what happens if you add a new feature down the road where you're listening on a different radio station that you don't want to stop listening to when your view disappears, which is rare, but it's possible. So I actually think uh, it's better here to use the version of this, which remove a server that takes the name. So I'm going to say remove server self, name is UI content, blah, 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 um, and the object is still nil. So I'm only going to remove uh, myself as a listener from that one radio station. And there's one last thing to do here, which is what happens if my view appears, I start listening, it disappears, and then they go change the text style. And then I reappear. Okay? I will not be notified at that point because the change, the text style change, happened while I wasn't listening. So turning your listening back on, doesn't, you don't get all the messages that happened while you weren't listening. You only get new messages. So that's why we probably want to say self use preferred fonts in view will appear. This is what I'm talking about where view will appear wants to sync up with the world when it starts. That's what view will appear is for. So view will appear is going to use preferred fonts, whatever are in it currently out there. Okay? That make sense why I'm doing that? So let's run this and see if it works. Now I'm running this on your device, but on your simulator you can also go to the um, settings. So here's my text, right? So let's even go ahead and put some orange text in there. Okay, now I'm going to hit the home button and I'm going to go to settings, which is right here. I'm going to go down to uh, general, I believe it is. Yeah, is that it? Yeah, text size. You see text size right there? You can see there's a slider, so let's make our text really big. Okay, go back. I can just go back to here. It's still running in the uh, simulator. Okay, so if I had to break points and stuff, that would all still work. And now you can see my font is big. I kept my orange right there. I could do this. I could put an outline on there. Green maybe. Okay, you can see the outline a little better with green. And now if I go back again to settings, and let's set this all the way to small and go back, back to our thing. You can see it updates it. Okay? So, make sense? Everyone understand what's going on there? Okay, so there you can see in that part we used, uh, we showed you how to do the preferred fonts in code, and we also used uh, the notification center to do the radio station, and we also used some more of the view controller lifecycle. So that was multi uh, hit there. And so, next time, what's coming up, on Wednesday, we're going to take this app and we're going to add some more view controllers to it. It's multiple view controllers. Now, it's very important to pay attention for that for your assignment, because that's the fundamental thing we're asking you to do in the assignment that's going to go out on Wednesday, is make multiple MVCs. Not just your machismo, it's still going to be machismo, but you're going to have to do another game, have both games on screen, uh, have yet another thing appearing on screen. So you're going to have at least three, and if you do extra credit, four or five uh, different MVCs. So we're going to rapidly start going up to multiple MVCs. We're going to talk about how to add MVCs with the tab bar and also navigation controller. That's the first two ways we're going to learn how to do that. Really important to understand for Wednesday is we're going to use inheritance because the two, two of your 
MVCs are going to be very similar. They're both going to be card games, but they're going to be a little different. You're going to want to use inheritance to share code between them, so I'm going to kind of get you started on that on Wednesday. And so I'll be sending out assignment three on Wednesday. Friday, we were going to be doing getting your device working with the free university developer program. Uh, however, that's not working technically right now, so we're going to put that off till next week. So next Friday, not this week's Friday, but next Friday, we will be having a section where you can come to the section and we'll help you get it so it's working on your device. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.